and welcome to this episode of the Martial Arts Studies podcast. This episode is made up mainly of um, the video and audio of um, a keynote presentation given by the translator Gigi Chang, who um, is a translator of Jin Yong novels. And um, we were at the same virtual <laughs> conference together in July. Um, and she gave her a keynote and it was very, very interesting. So I asked her if it would be okay if I podcasted it um, and she was happy with that. Hopefully in the near future, we will organize an interview where we'll talk more about the specific martial artsy dimensions of this particular form of cultural translation. The conference was called Chinese Popular Culture in Translation and Transmission. Um, and it was organised by Dr. Yan Wu from the University of Leicester in the UK and a group of academics from several other universities, mainly in China. It was very interesting. Um, and yeah, so I'll, I'll podcast this episode, uh, her keynote, and then next in the next episode, it will be my keynote, which followed. Um, and then hopefully at some point in the nearest future, we'll do a presumably Zoom, Zoom interview because she's in Hong Kong. And I'm in the UK, unless we can be in the same country at the same time together. We shall see. Either way, I hope you enjoy what follows. It's very interesting. So thank you very much, Gigi, for allowing me to reuse this material. I hope you all enjoy it. I'd like to uh, give you a brief introduction to the second speaker, Gigi Chang who is also a friend of mine. Uh, Zhang Jing translates from Chinese into English. Her fiction translations include Jing Yong's Wuxia Martial Arts series, Legends of the Condor Heroes, Shi Diao Ying Xiong Zhuan, Volume 2, A Bond Undone, Volume 3, A Snake Lies Waiting, co-translated with Anna Homewood, and Volume 4, A Heart Divided co-translated with Shelley Bryant. Her theater translations include classical Chinese dramas for the Royal Shakespeare Company and contemporary Chinese plays for the Royal Court Theater Hong Kong Arts Festival and Shanghai Dramatic Arts Center. She also co-hosts a regular program on plays and playwrights for the Chinese language podcast, Cultural Potato. Gigi. The floor is yours. Um, thank you so much. Let me try to get my screen sharing. Um, okay, I think I'm. I think my screen is now on everyone's um, desktop. So, hello everyone. I'm absolutely thrilled to be sharing my experience of translating Jin Yong's Legends of the Condor Hero with you today. Um, I'm sure the um, genre of wuxia. Hang on, let me take that after I get the next slide. Go oh, there. Um, I'm sure the genre of wuxia, Chinese martial arts fiction, needs little introduction to our audiences today. Um, tales of roving heroes and assassins can be dated back um, as early as Sima Tian's uh, Records of the Grand Historian, which was written for more than 2,000 years ago. And then um, two of the four great um, Chinese classics, Romance of the Three Kingdoms, as well as The Water Margin, which were both written around the 14th century, established many tropes that we continue to find in um, wuxia fiction today. And I'd say martial arts as a form of public entertainment is as old as street performers and acrobats in Chinese culture. Now, the spread of Chinese martial stories around the world is more recent mostly for films and TV shows from the last two decades. The first wuxia film that truly ca captured the global cinema goer was Ang Lee's um, Oscar-winning Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, which was released in the year 2000. But before that, there were many that paved the way, from cult classics made, made by the Shaw Brothers to action stars like Bruce Lee, Jackie Chan, Jet Li, and more recently, we have the animation franchise Kung Fu Panda, as well as the TV series uh, The Untamed, which plays onto the consciousness of international sci-fi and fantasy fans um, absolutely everywhere. Now, Jin Yong, I don't think he really needs much introduction 
today, but he's the pen name, um, you know, Jin Yong is the pen name of Louis Cha at Ta Leung Yong. And he's really known to pretty much every single Chinese speaker in the world. Um, he was born in 1924 in Hainan, Zhejiang, and he was sent to Hong Kong to work at a newswire translator in 1946. And in 1959, he founded his own Chinese language newspaper, Mingbo, in the then British colony. That decision led to the creation, creation of the persona Jin Yong, and in time, he became the grandmaster of wuxia fiction as we know today. Between the 1950s and the 1970s, he wrote 15 martial arts tales, most of them serialized daily in his own newspaper as a way to keep his um, readership hooked, you know, keep them buying his newspaper every day, and some for other periodicals that he was associated with. These stories took off by storm. It is estimated that at least 100 million of his books were sold, and there are more than 100 um, screen adaptations in the Chinese language. His stories and characters also received um, new leases of life through video games and comic books. Um, Wu, Jin Yong's wuxia novels were also quickly embraced by readers in Asia. Um, as early as the 1960s, they were translated into Vietnamese, then later to Korean, Japanese, Thai, Indonesian, between the 1970s and the 1990s. But it wasn't until the mid 1990s that Jin Yong's stories began to make its way on, into European languages. Before we started on the English translation of Legends of the Condor Heroes um, 10 years ago, there were only three other titles in English. Fox Voland of the Snowy Mountain, translated by Olivia Mock, The Deer and the Cauldron, translated by John Minford, and The Book and the Sword, translated by Graham Earnshaw. Now, the first installment of Legends of the Condor Heroes, uh, Sha Dao Ying Song Zhuan, appeared in the Hong Kong Commercial Daily on the 1st of January, 1957. And it took about one year to complete. Um, at the time it was being serialized, it was also collected um, in book form. Um, the earliest screen adaptation was actually also contemporary to the time when Jin Yong was writing um, the story for his newspaper. And since then, there have been a film or TV version every five or 10 years. It could be said that every generation of Chinese children grew up with their own Guo Jing. Now, our English translation came out um, in four volumes over four years between 2018 and 2021, which was about 60 years after he first um, started writing the story. Um, there were three of us working on the translation together because of the sheer volume of content. Anna Homewood, um, she was instrumental in securing the rights and finding an English language home for the novel. And um, she is um, on the um, far left of the screen. Um, and she started translate, um, she translated the first volume, A Hero Born, and set, set the tone for her work. I followed on with the second volume, A Bond Undone. And then on the third volume, um, A Snake Lies Waiting, Anna and I worked closely together. Um, with the final volume, A Heart Divided, our team got bigger and we had Shelley Bryant with us. Um, even though we joined the project at different stages, we set up to tell the story in one voice um, with the help of our editor, Paul Angles. And the first question we asked ourselves as translator was, why do Chinese readers love Jin Yong? And aligned our opinions. Luckily, it was actually quite an easy question to answer. You'll get more or less the same response if you ask around your friends or colleagues. Um, we sum up two key elements, um, rip roaring fun and unstoppable. If you break these descriptions down into more concrete aspects, then I would say it would be Jin Yong's effortless prose, his memor memorable stories and characters, as well as the exciting fights he created. Um, although the three of us grew up in, um, in different parts of the world, Anna in the UK, Shelley in the US and I in Hong Kong, we all came to martial arts stories through the silver screen. Um, and I think that would be the same for the majority of our readers today. 
it doesn't matter whether they have seen or have not seen any Chinese martial art films or animations or played video games that are you know on the subject or with related content they would have at least seen action movies or fight scenes you know anything from James Bond to the Matrix to Star Wars and there is a common language of movie imagination in action scene um, that we are trying to tap into as we translate. Um, this cinematic language is also how Jing Yong wrote. As the chief um, editor of his newspaper, he played many roles, including being the film reviewer from time to time. And he also dabbled in screenwriting and filmmaking. So what is our approach? It is actually quite simple. We set out to recreate the Chinese reading experience. We want our ex um, translation to be equally fun, addictive and exciting. But obviously that's much easier said than done. Um, we face huge challenges. The serialized story form, which is often quite meandering in plot and sometimes quite weak in narrative thrust, is more like a role-playing video game in the sense that we can choose to perform tasks and level up and try to get to the end of the game, or we can simply wander you know, interacting with NPC, but not really doing any other task, not actually improving ourselves in the story. Um, another tough aspect is that the story is driven by fights. Um, if you read like an English language novels or even with sort of sci-fi fantasy, um, even the action heavy ones, you know, fight scenes only take up maybe a small portion of the book. There will be a few battle scenes that are key or a few fight scenes. But with martial arts fiction, our fight scenes probably take up at least half the novel. Um, and it actually, if you're not used to reading so many fights, it can be fatiguing. Um, and also if you're more used to plot driven by a more naturalistic, more realistic circumstances. When you get a book where every single step of the way you're pushed forward by, by a violent or fighting, a, 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 a violent physical encounter, you probably would feel a little bit sort of odd or misplaced. Um, and then the other problem is that the book is also massively, massively long, um, almost a million uh, um, Chinese characters. In our English translation, the shortest volume um, is about 400 pages and the longest is pushing 600. So for the whole novel in English, we are talking about seven to eight sort of um, PhD dissertation in length for the whole project. And that includes your bibliography and appendices and notes. So it's just sheer volume. You know, imagine the time before Harry Potter, who read books that long in English particularly. And then we are also facing differences in our imagination because there are more than a, there are close to a dozen screen adaptations of Legends of the Condor Heroes alone, meaning the stories and the characters are already visually very well established in a good portion of our readers' minds. So what we are describing in words or what Jingyu originally described sometimes might jar with what we have seen and grown to love growing up on TV or on the, um, in, in the movie cinemas. And finally, we are up against prose that has a rather um, archaic feel. The, the, the big question is, how do we give that sense of time and history without our language being pretentious or plodding? Because we're not writing in the 19th century, we're not writing in the 1960s, we're writing in 2000 and, you know, 2018, 19, 20. So what we're used to and what, what what the time of the story is and also what the time Jinyo was writing it. Our solution, again, it sounds very simple, but <laughs> um, I'll explain later why it isn't as simple as it um, sounds, um, is to create a multi-sensory cinematic experience, um, tapping into the screen culture that I've talked about already through rhythm and pacing, using what is unique to the English language to recreate what makes Jin Yong's story so well loved. Um, in practice, I draw on two theories, particularly, which is in part influenced by my own background and interest. First is phenomenology uh, in, in a very, very broad and not particularly academic sense, as in the way we experience things with our body and our, all our senses. And that's in part came from the fact that I was trained as an art historian. I work in a museum. So I'm used to um, 
sort of my earliest, my first job is working in a museum, curating exhibition, working with objects, working in a physical space. And then the other is loosely drawing on the acting and directing method proposed by Stanislavski, asking questions about characters' intention, mapping the biographies and relationships, noting the events and the changes, and then keeping in mind all the gaps and all the questions that arise once we've wrapped our mind um, around the things that are going on in the stories. I mean, it's very difficult to do that in details because the book is just massively long. You know, we're not dealing with a play which is what, 20,000 works, we're dealing, dealing with a million works. Um, but because I love theater, I worked in theater translation, I've always wanted to do theater. Um, that is something I'm very interested in um, and that really informed the way I translate. Um, but I will say that I don't, actually think about um, these methods or theories consciously when I'm actually translating. They're just the deeper structure or foundation that inform my decisions. What is on the forefront of my mind is uh, actually the relationship they're negotiating. One is that as translators, we are the mediator between the author and our audiences. And when I talk about the author in this project, I really mean the plot and the characters. As for our audiences, um, here I'm calling them audiences rather than readers because they're very, very wide ranging. Um, so our final work tries to cater to that whole spectrum. There are traditional readers that will come to the translation in book form, in print, but there are also those who will only encounter the story as audio book, as audio, which is very, very linear and you can't flick back and forth like a book. Then we have audiences who are completely new to wuxia, and then there are those who have, who knows the story inside out, having read the novel in their own language, Chinese or otherwise, having watched multiple screen adaptations, etc. In a way, we are speaking to, um, I would say, um, kindergarten kids to postdoctorate fellows all at the same time. And we want to be comprehensible and fun for all of them without anybody feeling left out. So in the way we have to pitch in a very, very wide, um, we have to cast a really wide net, wide net to catch everyone. And to do that as translator, on one hand, we have to know every beat of the story, every stage of the characters and their development, as well as every moment of the emotional journey and shifting psychologies. To realize that, all that in our writing, we're essentially a one person production, playing director, cinematographer, designer, special effects, sound, lighting, performer, script writer, all at the same time and at any given moment as we are translating and rewriting our draft. Um, I will use two examples um, from the fourth volume, um, a, a, a Heart Divided, to illustrate my point. Um, I'll read out the English and you can see the Chinese, hopefully, uh, my internet is good enough, on the slides. Um, so this is the opening paragraph um, of the fourth volume. When our readers and listeners came to this book, it has been a year since the third volume uh, was published, where we end on the massive cliffhanger. The condors flew through the dark and heavy night. Guojing, clinging onto the bird's neck, called to Ulan using his internal strength, urging the Fagana horse to keep pace on the ground. The only light came from the mountaintop blaze they had fled. There was not a hint of the moon overhead, not a single star in sight. The condors were exceptionally strong, but soon the load of a fully grown human began to tell. As each flap of their wings grew more strained, they dip lower and lower. As you can see between the Chinese and the English, um, I the only the, the, the sort of three paragraphs I read is the first sort of five lines or so that I've underlined on the Chinese side of the, on the slide. And you can see that I've actually taken quite some liberty with the source text because this is the opening of a standalone book. Um, not just the start of a chapter in the middle of the novel, that you can read continuously. This is the first line you see when you open the book. Um, I need to grab our audience with both hands and keep them in their seats. I need to have impact immediately when you open the book. 
So the lines in red are what I added based on what happened before and what in the paragraphs following. The line in blue that you can see there, I lifted from a later paragraph, which I also highlighted in blue um, in, on the Chinese side of the um, uh, slide um, and moved it forward. Everything I've done here is to set the scene to remind audiences what has happened at the end of volume three a year ago, if they read it um, at the time it was published and what is at stake now. Um, I was essentially in a way, um, the director, the script writer, and the cinematographer rolled into one. So if you imagine this as the start of a film, I give you a wide shot of a dark night and the condors flying across the screen. And then we push the camera in. We see our protagonist um, riding on the condor. And then we hear him calling to his horse. Our camera, the pan, our camera pans down or cut to the horse um, galloping on the ground. And if you imagine you're in the cinema, so you know that something is happening. There is intrigue, we've built, we've built some intrigue here. And then we cut to another wide shot to see the mountain um, on fire, which is what our protagonist has run from. And then because it's a dark night, no star, no moon, it's you know, black sky, you know, premonition, that typical cin cinematic language of blackness. And then we hit the crunch point. The problem that troubles Tekkenis right now, the condors are being strained by their load, load. And then our story starts. It's basically like a cinema opening montage. You don't need any words. You just need music and a little bit of sound effect. And then the book starts or the film starts, you know, roll credits and, and you, you, you have a picture that sort of pulls you in and then you can read on and it's all the details of the story. And then the, other excerpt um, is a bit longer and it shows that we as translator how we sequence our information um, thread between points of views and how we employ all our senses even though we're reading words on paper or listening through our ears um, i will read it first before um so that i talk a little bit about sort of what what i've done she stepped inside the tomb passage and listened deathly silence. Unable to make out any sound from within, she began to venture forwards. Guojing hurried after her, feeling nervous about the hidden threats that they might find lurking underground. Lotus proceeded with caution, her mind reeling at the cracks and chips on the masonry, masonry lining the walls, testament to the fierce struggle that had taken place in the narrow passage. Several jung into the tunnel, a cudgel lie in her way. She picked it up and held it to the last of the light reaching in through the unguarded entry. One half of a steel yard, Gildan Tran's weapon. The balance beam wrought from refined iron was as thick as a child's arm. It had been snapped at the midpoint. Lotus caught Gorging's eye and saw what was on his mind a possibility she dare not voice. Only a handful of martial masters in this world had the strength to snap the sturdy instrument in two with their bare hands. Considering where they were now, this list narrowed down to one candidate, her own father. Gorging seized the broken weapon from Lotus shaking hands and stuffed it into his belt. Then he crouched low and felt his way along the progressively gloomy passageway. His heart was a string of buckets dancing up and down the shaft of a well as he searched for the rest of the weapon, at the same time desperately hoping that he would find nothing. The sounds of his rope dragging on the paving stones masked neither, neither the snuffles from his nose nor the whines from his snow, throat. He crawled. He groped, he stopped. He had come into contact with something hard and round, the counterweight, the flying budgeon his six, six shifu used to devastating effect in combat. He scooped it up and placed it in his pocket. It was too dark to see, so he let his sense of touch guide him. His fingertips brushed against something less hard than iron or stone, but as cold 
looked both. The undulating surface was almost waxy. A face? He jacked back, bang, and smacked his head into the marble-lined vault of the passageway. He was too busy fumbling in his shirt for the, his tinderbox to feel any pain. As the small flame burst into life, he felt the last vestige of air being punched out of his lungs. Inside, his head was being pounded into pulp. Outside, the corridor spun before his eyes. Blackness was all that remained. Now, here, a point of view flips between our two protagonists, Lotus Huang and Guo Jing, which I've color coded. Red is Lotus, blue is Guo Jing. And we're drawing on all their senses as well as ours as readers and um, listeners. There are moments of fading light and deepening darkness. There are moments we only have our hearing left. There are moments we have to rely on our sense of touch. Then we also have physical, the body's physical reactions to the discoveries. Um, I will admit that um, it has taken quite a bit of subjective processing of the information provided by the source text, um, whether to reorder the sequence of action or to slow down or hasten the pace of the pace of what is taking place in order to tighten the screw of tension. You can see the differences in length between um, the Chinese and the English. That really shows how much or li little needing of the source text was, was done. Um, some simply through paragraphing here, um, others through punctuation, um, others are more complex like through nailing down or shifting or elaborating the point of view. Um, like here on this slide, which was essentially uh, written as sort of like a two person semi neutral point of view. Um, but here I change it wholly onto a lotus point of view because the fear was hers. It was very much coming from, she looked at it and thinking, my father has done it. And then when she, when Gordon took the weapon from her, that's when the camera angle, our point of view changed to holy Guojing's because the rest of the discovery was made by him. Um, and then, um, and then there are other sort of techniques of writing that um, we, I, I use like through the sound of the words or the shape of the sentence um, to, 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 to mount um, tension, to create, um, to create an atmosphere. And none of this of what you're reading now could be arrived in the first draft. It was through a really lengthy process of rewriting and editing that we got to the result that you see in print or here recorded by, by our actor, Daniel York Lowe. I would say this is definitely the most satisfying part of translation, but at the same time, it is also extremely frustrating because it is impossible to map out or plan how we're going to make each, each decision. We don't know where our decisions will take us. We don't know where our destination is. We're really thumb, thumb, uh, sort of fumbling in the dark, groping our way forward. And sometimes our choices may trip us up later on in the book. And then we have to backtrack and retrace our steps and make adjustments. So we have to like push over everything we've built and restart. And sort of on, on this note, I, I would say, because translators are often called the bridge between cultures and languages. But for me, sort of what we're doing, especially what, with the experience of translating Jin Yong and as well as doing theatre work, I like to propose that we're in fact um, matchmakers. We're much more active. We're here to generate interest, to pull people together, to find similarities in what may seem diverging and very different. And we make connections and we bring works and people, you know, make, put, uh, create an environment where they can meet with the hope that our audiences will take the initiative after this first encounter to seek out more and choose the driving seat um, in the next adventure.
that they would continue to look up Chinese fiction, Chinese stories, Chinese film or TV shows. And, and, and I guess that would be sort of what every translator or, or anyone that works in, what works across culture would hope for. And with this note, um, I'll conclude my sharing today. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Gigi. Thank you for your appealing you. talk. Uh, I'm much impressed by your voice, full of passion, <laughs> because maybe this is uh, why you uh, do the theater work. Um, in this talk, uh, uh, Gigi Zhang shared with us how the translation team set out to recreate the thrilling experience of reading Jin Yong's Chinese martial arts adventures for an English language readership. We still have like five, uh, eight minutes for the Q&A session. Anybody uh, wants to ask uh, Gigi Zhang questions about her talk? You can uh, key in the question in the, uh, in the chatter box. Okay, there is one. Uh, I love your presentation style. Do you agree that translators will, uh, the translators with, with filmmaking expertise are more aware of sequencing information to make the plot flow like shot transitions in the film? So I consider film directors with high English efficiency or translators with, with filmmaking experience expertise may be better candidates to translate literary works. What do you think about that? Um, I personally don't think necessarily so sort of filmmaking is necessary. I think as translator, we are first and foremost writers. And if you're a translator of fiction, you're a storyteller as well. You, you, you are as much a storyteller as the author you're translating. Um, in the sense that, um, because if you don't have that visual imagination, then how do you read a story and explain it in a different language? Um, but definitely an interest um, in sort of modern cinematic or film or TV culture is helpful because you can see um, you can see stories in sort of a more multi-layered sense. Um, you can see it in with different eyes because um, even though um, book, book and film are relatively linear, we can, um, in the sense that you can see and think about, um, so um, the sequence of action. So does this happen first or does that happen first? Um, an example would be like, if you write a book, you can have, um, this is some, a, short, a short excerpt that I translated not long ago, um, a character landed on a boat and then in a book there is a description of this character and then the dialogue starts. But if you think about it, especially in sort of like an, think about it in sort of audio book form, because if you read on a page you can see multiple lines at the same time, but if, if it's like you're watching something or you're hearing something, three lines could be 10 seconds, 20 seconds then suddenly you created a pause in the story. So if that person landed on a boat as a reader or as the character that you kind of like, oh, a stranger landed on my boat, do you talk to that person for at first? Or do you look them up and down and then say something? Because that creates a completely different um, dramatic tension. And that's kind of decision, I think as a translator, especially sort of with wuxia because we set out to make it fun to 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 create an, an exciting um reading experience that is that can be compared to all the exciting action films you've seen pacing is important we can't let it slack so in this sense um some form of a sort of cinematic or movie or tv experience or awareness helps because you're thinking constantly of time and of what you see first, what you feel first, and how you build up the information to um, moment by moment revealing secret by secret, like the, the long section that I read. You know, you go from 
the tunnel which has some light to complete darkness that you're kind of groping around finding things. You sort of create that tension and that is progress and logic within. So I hope that kind of answers your question. Thank you. Uh, there's another question in the, uh, in the chat box. Um, that is uh, Zhao Bi, one of my colleagues. Thank you very much for your talk. I'm curious about your translation experience, about being tripped by your earlier translation and having to go back to change it. Could you, could you please give one example? Oh, usually it's to do with the physical setting. The room turns out to be bigger or smaller than I thought. You know, sometimes I thought it's something is happening indoor, turns out to be outdoor or something that's supposed to be happening outdoor, the way it's described is almost like indoor because, you know, when you watch a, a wuxia, a, a martial arts a TV drama, the setting is set for you, you don't have to think about it. But in a book, Jin Yong might have thought very detailed about it, but he didn't, might not necessarily have written it out. And when you read the book now, as anyone who would read Jin Yong today, our imagination has already been um, brainwashed by, you know, decades or years of period drama. When you say a tavern, we all had a fixed idea of what it looks like. It's got two floors. There is a balcony, there's a matinee. People are going to jump down, stairs are being smashed, tables are being upturned. You have very clear idea what it's going to look like. But sometimes that is not actually be, is written. And occasionally, um, I also got tripped out by sort of architectural details. When it says a bridge, I think traditional Chinese bridge, which is arch. And then suddenly later on in description, I've got pillars, which is more of a Western bridge, you know, where we're talking about sort of, you know, viaduct type structure. And then you have to, everything you've imagined actually looks wrong. And then you have to, basically start that whole sequence again with the right architectural elements so our sort of martial scene can play on it accurately like it's been described because otherwise some of the, um, the the fights couldn't have happened if it's an arch bridge there's no pillar to fight on <laughs> there's just nothing <laughs> yeah. it's been collapsed here yeah. okay we have a uh, um, last question uh, it's from Hannah Thank you for this great talk and congratulations on the books. I feel it is a very smooth reading experience. So I'm wondering if you can say more about how the translation team tackled some of the complicated cultural elements, such as acupoints, while still maintaining the story's momentum and being comprehensible. Could you walk us, uh, walk us through an example? <laughs> yeah, um, sort of ArcuPoints, what we've done with ArcuPoints is we um, use the English translation, so we never use pinyin on the ArcuPoints, so if it's, uh, 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 sort of let me think of an example, um, uh, I think um, the, el the one on the elbow, I think the inside of the elbow is called Xu Chi, so I think it's called pull on the bend, and then we would add in the body part. So we, we essentially, I've downloaded an app on my phone that explains all the acupoints. And each, each time I fight, they fight with the acupoints. I look up on the map and put the description of that body part in. So, you know, sometimes it's hitting, you know, on the sternum, it could be in the middle of the, on the back, on the nape of the neck. Um, above the elbow, below the elbow, forearm. Um, so we give really precise um, body parts. So even if you have no idea where that point is, at least you know which part of the body is being hit. <laughs> yeah. So that's one example. And then, you know, there's also various sort of more spiritual, you know, quoting from um, Taoist, Buddhist, um, that kind of, or, 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 or classical um, Chinese text. Um, with those, we generally try to work it into the story to make it more atmospheric and, and feels more natural. So rather than um, the author throwing some highbrow text into the story, we try to weave it into the character's emotions or the dialogue for more, so rather than just a quote. 
So it doesn't feel like um, he's Xiao Shu Dai. He's not just you know quoting and showing off his knowledge. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the time is up. Thank you for your illuminating talk. Thank you, Gigi. And there are yeah. maybe a couple of questions in the chat box. If you like, you can answer uh, the questions there. Okay. So, okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very um, much. Thank you. Um, the third speaker of the keynote session is Professor Paul Bowman. Hi.